All right, y'all, can we give it up for our middle schoolers as they make their way out today? Come on, well, let's do better than that. Let's cheer on our middle schoolers. So many places they could be, they came to church today, whether their parents made them come or they came on their own. We're grateful that they're here with us today. If you've got a middle school student, you can send them out now or they're more than welcome to stay in service. Also want to let you know that we have middle school midweek services that happen uh, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. And that ministry is doing a phenomenal job. So thank God for the volunteers uh, and the ministry leaders that are leading uh, that ministry. Hey, if you're brand new around here, I want to tell you, thank you so much for showing up. You could have been doing something else today, but you came to church on this beautiful day. Can we get up for our first time guests? Let them know we appreciate them as well. Also, if you're watching online, thank you so much for watching. And if you are out at Church in the Park, we are grateful for you today as well. Uh, we are continuing our series today as we are traveling through the book of Acts for about a year. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the book of Acts, the book of Acts gives us the story of the early church and how, it got, how, it, how they got their start. When Jesus rose from the dead, he spoke to his disciples, 11 of them at first, to let them know, I have a mission for you to accomplish, to go out into the world and make disciples of me. He shows up again early in the book of Acts and talks to about 120 of them and let them know that they need to wait on God's spirit to show up in order for them to accomplish this difficult mission that he had given them to go into the world, let the world know that the Messiah has come, his name is Jesus, and they could be saved and have their relationship with God restored. The book of Acts gives us the details of how this takes place, and it is miraculous to see the progress that the early church was able to make. These individuals had no power, no authority, no money. As a matter of fact, they had opposition that seemingly could have wiped them out, but because of the Spirit of God, the early church is able to survive all sorts of challenges and trials that they go through. While they should have been experiencing only trials, they also have a lot of triumph where thousands of people are able to come into faith in Jesus Christ and be disciples of Jesus when this movement should have been stomped out as soon as it got started. But there is something about this movement that made it work that uh, other movements do not have. Other movements ha might have money, but they don't have this. Other movements may have power and prestige, but they don't have this. The thing that made the early church distinct and different from any other movement was the fact that it was equipped by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God empowered those who were er the early church. The Spirit of God enabled those in the early church to accomplish and do things which they could not do on their own. And as we read the book of Acts, it is an example for the church today on how we can accomplish the mission that God has given to us. The mission remains the same, to go out into the world and make disciples. The mission remains the same for us to be salt and light in the world. And we can only accomplish this with the Spirit of God empowering us to do it. And thanks be to God here at Bayside Blue Oaks, we've seen the Spirit of God at work even throughout this series and before. Uh, we've seen a a hundred people plus get baptized over the last couple of months. We've seen many students come to know Christ. We've seen adults show up to this church and get to know Jesus and have their lives transformed forever. And that isn't credit to any of us. It is a credit to the power of the Spirit of God. Is anybody grateful that the Spirit of God is present here today? So we've made it to chapter number 12, and we'll see that the church continues to have some issues. Uh, chapter 12, verse number 1 says this. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. As we open up chapter number 12, we're introduced to a new person in the passage whose name is King Herod. King Herod was the king over the region of Judea and Samaria in Galilee, where the early church got its start. He was put into power by the Romans, and he is given uh, uh, influence over these areas where there are Christians that are now making a ruckus in his kingdom. King Herod, who we talk about in this text, is Herod Agrippa I. There are many Herods that you read about in Scripture. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 2, we read about his grandfather, who is also named King Herod. King Herod in Luke chapter 2 was an individual that upon hearing that the wise men were going to the east to seek the Messiah, he was so crazy that he had every boy two and under killed because he knew that one of them may just be the Messiah. He was an evil ruler, and the apple did not fall too far from the tree as his grandson now is arresting Christians with the intent of persecuting them. But as we look at this passage, it shows us something, that there were evil rulers before Jesus, there are evil rulers ruling during the time of Jesus, and there are evil rulers ru ruling even after the resurrection of Jesus. Here's the truth. Our world 
is full of evil rulers. However, every evil ruler has their day. Listen closely. Evil, evil rulers rule temporarily, but God rules forever. Let me rewind, press play on that one more time just in case you didn't hear me. Evil rulers rule temporarily, but God rules forever. Throughout the lifetime of history, we've seen evil rulers rise up and cause all sorts of ruckus, but none of them have lasted at all. Why? Because they are not eternal, they are temporary. But God rules forever. He outlasts evil, will defeat evil, and one day all evil will be gone because God will rule forever. So what does this evil ruler, Herod, do? He has some Christians arrested with the intention of killing them. Uh, there are frequent ups and downs for the church. Uh, if you've been through us throughout this series, you should understand that whenever you see the word persecution, something good is about to happen. Uh, it's amazing that these early Christians, whenever they were persecuted, they would multiply and gain an influence and grow in their ability to accomplish the mission for God. Why? Because persecution could not stop the Spirit of God. You can't chain up the Spirit of God. You can chain up the people, but the Spirit will always be there. And whenever they uh, wrestled up the hornet's nest of those who were part of the church, the church began to spread more. Why? Because the Spirit of God cannot be stopped. I'm grateful that even difficulty can't stop a move of God from happening in the world around us. Don't worry when bad things happen because God is at work even in the bad times of our lives. These moments of trial are frequently followed by moments of triumph. But there's another lesson here in verse number one is that we have an enemy. And the enemy wants to stop us and wants to destroy us. And the early church had an enemy. They knew that these rulers wanted to get rid of them. But how did the early church deal with that? Or did they get online and talk about these evil rulers and complain about them? No. Or did they go into hiding? No. Uh, these early Christians were so committed to the mission of God that even in the face of opposition and difficulty, they stayed close to God and they kept with God's mission, that nothing was going to make them give up, that they were willing to lay down their lives. They understood the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12 that say this, Blessed are you when people insult you, and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Think about that, church. These early believers knew this verse, and they knew that great was their reward in heaven, so much so that when they were persecuted, they did not even worry about dying because they understood there was a reward that was waiting for them. The Bible says rejoice and be glad in our trials. But that's not our testimony. We are frequently ready to resent people and be mad when trials come. But what if we flipped the script and understood that we have an eternal perspective and we know that even if I die, even if things get hard, I can still put my trust in a God that has a reward for me in all of heaven. This world is temporary, but the world that I'm going to is eternal and God has a reward waiting there for me that far surpasses anything I can ever get in this world. We got to have that type of mentality if we're going to survive the world today. So we had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. So verse 2 introduces us to this concept. It says he had James, he being Herod, had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. In other words, he was beheaded. Think about this for a moment. As we've looked through the book of Acts, uh, we haven't seen any of Jesus' direct disciples, ones who were with him while he was walking the earth, uh, be martyred. Uh, we did see Stephen was martyred. We saw some others who came to the faith martyred, ones who uh, never really met Jesus. But James was a part of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. He's one of the first 12 that is called. He becomes part of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John. These three were the ones that Jesus was closest to. And we read this verse about James. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. James barely gets any mention when he gets martyred, when he is killed. This man had been with Jesus. He had seen Jesus walk on water. Jesus had washed his feet. He had seen Jesus feed thousands of people. He was connected to Jesus. He was close to Jesus, and he was still put to death. Hey, y'all, you can follow Jesus with your whole heart. You can attend church on Sunday. You can be a generous giver, but it does not exempt you from experiencing persecution. Listen, being in a relationship with Jesus doesn't exempt you from experiencing difficulties in life, not even death. And some of us 
have this flaw in our belief system about God that when we give our lives to God, everything in our life is going to be perfect and we won't have any issues and we won't go through any trials. And that's why many people I've seen, unfortunately, walk away from the faith when they experience a difficulty thinking that it means that God loves them less. Listen, God doesn't love you less just because you go through a trial or things don't work out your way or your health is in crisis. No, God is still with you in the midst of those things. We live in a fallen world, but God is still with us. People frequently, erroneously believe that following Jesus exempts you from problems. It does not. Jesus said, and in John 16, 33, I've quoted it many times around here, he said, in this world, you will have troubles. So don't take problems as a sign that God doesn't love you or he doesn't care for you. When you read this, you may ask, why didn't Jesus step in and do something? If there was anybody who deserved an extra uh, little bit of time on earth, it was James. I mean, he was with Jesus every single day for three years, gave up his fishing business, decided to walk with Jesus. Then after Jesus raises from the dead, James shows back up, and God uses James to help spread the gospel, and then James dies. Have you ever asked yourself the question, God, can you do something? Can, can you take this disease away from me? I've walked faithfully with you. Can you give me a financial Blessing, can you, can you help me with my child that's disobedient? I'm walking with you every day. And Jesus would say to you, I did do something. I came to this earth, I died on the cross, and I rose from the dead, and I've given you eternal life. And if Jesus doesn't do anything else for you, he's already done enough because he's blessed you with the gift of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. God is not sitting by idly not doing anything for you. He already did the best thing for you, which was give his son to die for you. So let's make sure we walk with Jesus even in our hardships, knowing he has already done enough. Is anybody grateful that God gave his son so you and I can experience eternal life? So he takes James, cuts his head off. That's the last mention we get of James. Verse number three. When he, being Herod, saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. He was like, man, I took out uh, James. The people love this. The Jews love that I'm doing this. Let me go get the other guy who was in Jesus' inner circle. Peter, let me seize him too. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. So this sicko Herod uh, loved putting James to death so much so that he goes and he arrests Peter and he's got an intention to do the same thing with Peter, uh, but this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is also known as the Passover celebration. A couple times a year, Jewish men would show up in Jerusalem in order to celebrate different festivals, and this was the Festival of Unleavened Bread. During this time period, the whole city would shut down for a week, and they wouldn't have anybody go on trial or put anybody to death during this time. So that is the time in which Peter is arrested. And often when we read our, a text, we see ourselves as the people being oppressed. And we read about Peter being taken and shackled. We read ourselves into the passage. Yeah, we're, we're like Peter or we're like James going through the hard time. But here's the reality, y'all. We got to be careful that we also could have something in common with Herod. Herod did what he did, so he was living for people's approval and acceptance. Now, I know you and I would never do that. We'd never live for people's approval and acceptance, right? Let's be careful not to fall in the trap of seeing ourselves as the hero in a passage. Listen, as a pastor... I got to be careful not to fall in the trap of living for people's approval and acceptance. I mean, I can tell you what you want to hear. Uh, I can get applause. Uh, I can uh, make you tell you that your blessing is on the way, make life feel good for you. But if I were to do that, I would be being a horrible pastor. I can't just feed you candy all day. Sometimes I got to give you some bitter vegetables that you just got to eat. If I get up here and only tell you what you want to hear, I'm only doing it for your acceptance and your approval. But y'all, there is one whose approval means a whole lot more to me than yours does. I love you, but I don't need your approval. His name is Jesus, and I want to make him glad and make him smile and live for his approval. So what's that mean for all of us? Because all of us face this temptation. What it means is this, that we got to seek the approval of God over the approval of man. Because at the end of the day, People are going to go and they're going to be finicky, but God is the one who you can trust and has been faithful to you, so you got to be faithful to him. I will be faithful to God's word even when I don't want to. We all got to make that decision to live for God's approval because doing what God commands won't always get you the approval of people, but it will get you the approval of God. Verse number four, after arresting him, he put him in prison. So he takes Peter, arrests him, puts him in prison, handing him over to be guarded. Listen, 
by four squads of four soldiers each. So how many soldiers were there? We got some math wizards in here. We got some others that are struggling. 16, 16. Four squads of four. X equals four by four. 16. I'm not good at math myself, but I've been studying this week to be prepared for that. <laughs> so they put Peter in jail and they get 16 soldiers. Herod is like, hey, I heard about Peter being in jail one time before. And Peter was able to break free. Well, this time we're going to make sure it does not happen. So we're going to take four squads of four soldiers and put them in prison. So they take two of the soldiers and chain them directly to Peter. Peter is chained on both sides by two soldiers. And the other... 16, Four, uh, 14, the other 14, I told y'all I wasn't good at math. The other 14, the other 14 are guarding the doors of the jail. So Herod has made up his mind, hey, Peter ain't getting out of jail. There is no way he is going to be here. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like this where you didn't see any way out? Have you ever been in prison moment in life? And not, not literally, some of y'all literally, that's okay. But others of, of us, Figuratively, we feel shackled by debt or financially. We feel shackled in a relationship. We are shackled mentally. We've got stress or mental health issues that we're dealing with. Our, our physical health is bad. Have you ever felt like you were shackled in an impossible situation and you didn't see your way out? And you're, as a matter of fact, you're ready to give up. But just like Peter in this passage, Every part of you is chained. There's no way out. There's nothing that Peter can do, and you're in a situation where there's nothing that you could do. What do you do when life has you shackled? I love verse 5. It says this. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. When you find yourself in a situation that there seems to be nowhere out, the early church teaches us a valuable lesson, and it is this, that we have to earnestly pray for God to bring us out, that when moments arise in our lives where you can't see a way out, you got to go to God because God always knows the way out. It says the church was earnestly praying. Now, I love the early church because they set a great example for us here. The church is earnestly praying for Peter who's in a situation that he can't get out of. But what did this church just experience? They just experienced the death of James. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you've been praying and what you were praying for and what you wanted didn't happen and then something else came up and you thought to yourself, you know what, I'm not even going to pray this time. I was talking to a guy not too long ago. Uh, he had unfortunately recently lost his brother who has had some mental health challenges and he lost his brother and he said he had been praying for his brother and he lost him anyway. He was like, why do I even need to pray? When God has already made up his mind what to do. Listen, y'all, prayer is not about you getting what you want. It's about you getting close to God and experiencing intimacy with him and trusting him in the process. If we prayed and we always got what we want, that would make us God. And you and I are horrible gods. We can't even run our households that well. How in the world we think we can run our whole lives? But prayer is much deeper than that. It's about intimacy. It's about communicating with God. It's about being near and dear with him. The early church says nothing will stop us from praying. That although James was just killed, we trust and we pray that even in this impossible circumstance that God will show up. My challenge for some of y'all today is you've given up on prayer because you didn't get what you want. I want you to go back to God and trust him and develop a relationship with him and believe that he can answer your prayers. Don't stop believing just because you didn't get what you want. Take it as an opportunity to draw near to God. Prayer is not an opportunity to be God. Prayer is an opportunity to meet with God. One more time. Prayer is not an opportunity to be God. Prayer is an opportunity to meet with God. Hebrews 4.16 says this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Even when the Bible talks about prayer, it says we may get what we need, but we may not. But just because God does not give us exactly what we want does not mean that we should not draw closer to him every opportunity we get. Listen, go to God in prayer and God will strengthen you and enable you to handle whatever it is that you're going through. Just because you don't get what you want doesn't mean that God doesn't know what you need and you need him more than you need anything else in this world. Go to God and pray. Why should we pray though? Why should we pray? Why? 
Well, let me give you two reasons. One, Jesus prayed. If Jesus prayed, who was God in a bod, how much more do you and I need to pray? I mean, Jesus took time out of his life frequently to pray. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Jesus often retreated to a quiet place to pray. Before choosing his disciples, he prayed. Before teaching his disciples the Lord's Supper, he prayed. Before uh, he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, he prayed. In the garden, before he was arrested to stand trial, to go to the cross, Jesus prayed. Y'all, the example has been set to us by Jesus. And perhaps you and I would have more power and authority and more of God's spirit in our lives if we took time to pray to God on a regular basis and made it a habit of our lives that we spend time in prayer every single day day and not even Jesus always got what he wanted when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane when he's about to go to the cross he says Lord let this cup pass from me and it didn't and he got to the point where he said not your will but mine be done I want to have that type of faith where I trust God's will over my own ways and that comes from having an intimate relationship with him and praying with God on a daily basis why should we pray first reason Jesus prayed second reason it's good for your health Secular scientists have discovered that prayer is actually good for your health. They all agree, even those who wouldn't consider themselves religious, if they've done studies, have discovered that it's good for your health. Uh, the internal journal, excuse me, the international, not eternal, the international journal of psychiatry, not known for their biblical influence. According to these, their studies have found that prayer reduces stress, reduces anger and aggression, it calms you and gives you peace. I'm just curious, how many of y'all could use a little reduced stress in your life? Everybody. All of us could use a little anger management. All of us could be less aggressive. Many of us could be more calm and have peace. And science says, as you spend time in prayer, these are the natural benefits along with getting closer to God. You want to strengthen your faith? Become a person of prayer. We don't, we don't believe that, or we don't really acknowledge how much prayer can transform our lives. I remember when I was moving to Sacramento uh, from Atlanta, making this huge move. There are many things that we have been praying about. Uh, and one was when we moved here, where in the world we were going to live. And so while my wife and I were still living in Atlanta, we put our house for sale. Thankfully, we were able to sell our house. But we were like a month out from moving to Sacramento. We had no place to live at all. Uh, there was no way we could buy a house in California. We come from Georgia. You can buy a house in Georgia for $250,000. I don't even think going to the bank in California with $250,000. So we were coming out here looking for a house, and we found one place that we could rent. And we go to that place. We put our application in. There was a bunch of other applications. We flew in town just for this purpose. We were looking through, trying to find other places to rent. We couldn't find anywhere else to rent. And the lady let us know, hey, I've got your application, but I've got six or seven other applications. I'll let you know whether or not we'll get into this house. And I'm earnestly praying because I'm moving to Sacramento in a month. And if God doesn't come through, I was going to come here and be homeless. But I was going to come because this is where the Lord called us to. But later that day, and she told us she'd let us know by the end of the week. Later that day, she called us and let us know, hey, we've given you the house. You guys can move on on X date. And thank God, in that situation, it worked out. And my wife and I were earnestly praying in that moment, and it worked out. Listen, y'all, there are some times when we pray where it does work out, and it shows you that God is near to you. What if you committed to taking everything of your life to God in prayer so you can see that God is intimately aware of what's happening into your life? Take it to God in prayer. Peter was in jail, but the church was praying for him because they believed that God could make a difference. Uh, we're going through something uh, called Rooted with our staff right now. Uh, this is all of our Bayside staff. It's a discipleship journey. journey. Uh, and through this discipleship journey, there's a 45-minute prayer experience. It's where we all gather together in the sanctuary over at Granite Bay. Uh, we separate out, and for 45 minutes straight, we pray. Now, y'all, I love Jesus, but I also, like, really have ADD. Oh, so that day going into the experience, I'm thinking to myself, like, man, we got to pray for 45 minutes. 45 minutes? How are we going to pray for 45 minutes? I don't have nothing to say after the first three. 45 minutes. <laughs> but as we were studying that day, or a couple days prior, in the text, it's like prayer is not just you talking to God. It's about God talking back to you. But most of us don't sit still enough for God to say anything to us. So we started that 45 minutes, read a passage to get us started. Then I was completely silent. Then I just started writing down what the Lord was leading on my heart. Next thing I know, the 45 minutes was passed, and God had spoken to me in ways that I had never imagined because I was willing to sit down and be quiet. Our lives are so loud 
that we cannot hear God until we pause and pray. So as you came in today, you were given a prayer card. If everybody could pull that out, if you've got a bulletin, pull out a prayer card. If you need one, our ushers have one. I need everybody to participate uh, in this as we do this together. If you need a prayer card, just lift up your hand. Our usher will hand you one. I want everybody to take out that prayer card, and we're going to do something a little bit unorthodox. We need one right here on the front row, a couple down here, a couple over here in the back. What we're going to do, y'all, for the next 45 minutes, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> y'all are like, hold on now. We're going to do a minute. We're going to start with a minute. We're going to start with a minute. We can all do that. We're going to start with one minute. We're going to sit for the first 30 seconds. I want you to pray directly to God. We need some cards here in the middle. I want you to pray for the first 30 seconds. Then after that 30 seconds, I want you to write down whatever it is that God tells you to write down. If that's a prayer request, write that down. Whatever your request is that you're giving to God, write it down. All right, we got a couple more over here who need a card. If you don't have a card, uh, by this time, you can just put it in your phone, whatever it is that you need to do. But on that prayer card, write down your request. So we're going to take the next minute. We're going to do this together. Hey, y'all, I know it's going to feel awkward whenever you do something new. It might feel awkward. That's okay. Let's be okay with silence. Let's take a minute to be silent to hear from God. We're going to start right now. Amen. Thank you all for participating in that. Church, I'm going to finish this, the sermon in a moment, but there's something I feel led to do that I've been feeling led to do for two years, but I haven't done. And today I'm just going to be obedient and do it. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad was a pastor, and um, one of the things that I remember being with my dad with a lot is he would go and visit families who were dealing with infertility, and as a, a little boy, when I was 12, this was something that was very formative for me. I would be with my dad. We would pray with families. And some of them would have babies miraculously. Others of them would adopt kids, which was also a miracle and a blessing. And then others, just nothing would happen for them. And this common experience for me became something that helped form my faith because I got to walk with people as they prayed to God and see them, some cases, not get what they want, but still grow in their faith. In other cases, see them, see God open up wounds, wombs. And they had kids or whatever the problem was, they was solved. And it was a very formative thing. And for two years, I felt an impression of the Holy Spirit on me to speak directly to people who are part of our church who are dealing with infertility. I know this is unorthodox, but, but I, I can't not do it anymore. I have to say something to you. If you are here today and you're dealing with infertility, I want you to know that God is with you. Second thing I want you to know is that I've been praying for you. Third thing I want you to know is do not lose hope. I know you didn't come to church expecting to hear this, but just as Peter was in a situation that was impossible and he needed the Holy Spirit to show up, I'm praying 
that God would show up in your life as well. And I know this is a sensitive thing for me to even discuss, and I was reluctant to do it, but I have to say it because I'm going to be obedient to God. So I want to take a moment as we finish this service to pray for you, whether you've perhaps gone through miscarriage after miscarriage, or you haven't been able to get pregnant, as you're part of a church where we almost have as many kids as we do adults. You see these families running around, you see these kids running around, and your heart is grieved by that, and you continue to show up. I want you to know that God is near you, and he sees you. This next part, this is, this is, this is the part that I have been afraid to do, but I'm going to do it. I know this is personal. It's a personal thing. But we are a church family. And we want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you, old school style, if that's you, you don't have to. But if that's you, would you come to the altar so we as a church can earnestly pray for you? I, I, I know. I know it's, you might be embarrassed. I know it's personal. But if that's you, just come to the altar so we can pray for you. I'm looking for someone. There's a lady. <sighs> My mind is crazy right now. There's a board member whose wife I talked to about this. Yeah, can you come? Can you come? Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Come on, come on stage. Come on stage. This way, this way. talk to you about this and share this with you at a party that I wanted to do this and you shared something with me then but I don't even remember what it is <laughs> and I'm asking you to share that now and then I'm asking that you would pray for our brothers and sisters who are here many of them going through stories and situations that most of us cannot imagine church let's stand with them and let's earnestly seek God with them I'm going to give you the mic. Say whatever it is you want to say. Uh, 33 years ago, I was dealing with infertility, and it was, there were reasons for it. And, you know, and I thought, well, my hope isn't in a child. My hope is in God. But this is the most painful thing I've ever faced in my life. And I saw all of my friends that were birthing babies and we were trusting God with it. And this missionary came from Africa. He said, you look very sad. And I said, I'm barren. And he said, may I pray for you? And he laid hands on my womb. And afterwards he looked at me and said, you will have many children. And the next month I was pregnant with twins. I did have... <laughs> And you'll see her here with her four kids. And I had ended up having 
lots of miscarriages, ectopic pregnancy, um, four kids later. And um, also, after that, I, I just kept thinking, God, and if not, you're still good. And I knew in my heart that regardless of the outcome, that he is faithful, he loves me, the nearness of him is my good, and that nothing will separate me from his love. And then my daughter, my youngest daughter, I had four, three daughters and a son, my youngest daughter, Sarah, is going through infertility. And she hasn't been able to have children for eight years. I can't even imagine the grief. I've experienced it, but I can't imagine another person's journey. But what I do know is this, that if God is for me, who can be against me? Nothing shall separate me from the love of God. And I know that God is all knowing and he's all loving. So the, the thing for me was not in asking the question why, but it was looking in the face of Jesus and knowing who he is, that he longs to be gracious to us. So I look at all of you incredible people here today and I just want to say to you that God is for you. He loves you. Your tears are in a bottle. Great is his faithfulness. You may have, you know, weeping for a life, uh, a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And he will never change. Thank you. Would you, would you pray? Lord God Almighty over the heavens and the earth. We lift you up this morning and we are so grateful for your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy. It is new every morning. God, our hope, you say hope deferred makes the heart sick. Our hope isn't in what you accomplished for us. Our hope is in you alone, but I do lift up these brothers and sisters. You say when one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. So I commit these sorrows that you're acquainted with. I put them on the altar of these beautiful people that are standing before you now. And I pray in the matchless name of Jesus, the name that is above every name on heaven and earth, that you would bless these families here, that your hand would be upon them, that you would keep them from evil, and God enlarge their borders. I ask for miracles, the miracles of children. Yes. Lord, we ask in your precious holy name, and Father, we trust you, and if not, you are still good, but this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice, so we rejoice with you now. Great is your faithfulness. So we commit these beautiful families in your hand, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we give it up for God for this moment? For those of you that are down here. For those of you that are down here, I want to get your information before you leave so I can pray for you by name. And so that when the miracle does happen, we can celebrate together as a church because I believe that God can open up doors that nobody can shut. And even if he doesn't, God is still good. So Kenzie, can you walk with them, take them back into the pastor prep room and I'll be back there in just one moment. You guys follow the young lady in the yellow shirt. And we're not doing anything weird back there. Just going to write your names down and pray for you. Not bringing out like the snake oil or anything of that sort. Uh, one other quick thing, guys, uh, as everybody's standing. I just want to say, I'm thankful that I get to be your pastor and that God has put me in this position. And I would only have done what I did today if I felt the freedom to do it from the people that God has shepherded me, allowing me to shepherd. So thank you for letting me be your pastor. I'm grateful for that.